I'm gonna roll with All right. it. So do I take roll? All right, so the, uh, this meeting is called to order. Tap. It's 6.08 p.m. Uh, my name is Sarah Clendenning, President of Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. Uh, this is a Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council General Board meeting. The date is January 6, 2022. It is 6.09 p.m. Um, roll call, please. One second. Sarah Clendenning. Present. Ben Watsworth. Present. Vincent Montalvo, Fernando Sanchez present, Nancy Soto, present, Benny Madera, here, Didia Delizer, here, Joanna Iraeta, here, Diana Tran, here, Emily Har. Oh, let me see if I can unmute her. So. Cool. I believe I unmuted you, Annalie Har. Here, can you, you hear me? Yeah. Melanie Bolomo Shiflet. Here. Victor Asanedo. Oh, he is, has a accused absence. Diego Zapata. Is it? Gil Arevalo. Here. Richard Ortiz. Steve Lucero. Yeah. Selena Ortega. Oh, Richard's not here? No. Oh, okay. One second. Present. All right. That's 14. We have quorum. We have quorum. All right, one second. All right, so yeah, uh, our usual uh, man behind the wheels of steel, uh, Vince Montalvo is uh, not at the meeting right now. So that's why it was a little slow uh, getting started. So with that, we have done roll call. Now we will move on to non-agenda public comments. Let me get my timer going here. So if there's anybody from the public who would like to comment, on any not anything that's not on the agenda. You have two minutes to speak. Please raise your hand or press star nine. Where's my timer? Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, hands up, Fernanda? Let's see. Okay, we have two. Yeah, hands. we have two hands up. Okay. So um, one is Annalie Har, so one hand up, Jessica Swan. Right, Jessica Swan. You have two minutes to speak. You have been unmuted. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Jessica. Awesome. Hi there. Um, again, this is Jessica Swan. I am the public participation specialist for the Department of Toxic Substances Control. I work on the Avenue 34 project as well as other projects in the Los Angeles area. So I wanted to um, come here tonight to tell everyone that we will, DTSC will be hosting a workshop on Wednesday, February 9th at 6 p.m. This will be an interactive workshop that will cover DTSC's site mitigation process and affiliated public participation activities and focus on the Avenue 34 project. Spanish translation is going to be provided and invitations will go out about two weeks before. Um, we encourage you all to share this information with anyone who may be interested. So again, the workshop is going to be held on February 9th at 6 p.m. February 9th, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. DTSC workshop for Avenue 34. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Let's see any more public comments? Please raise your hand or press star nine. Not see any more. All right, so that's, then we'll move on to the next item. Item number four, community and board announcements, two minutes per person. So if there's anybody from the community, or, uh, we'll start with the community. Anybody from the community who has an announcement in general, um, you have two minutes to speak. Please raise your hand or press star nine. Let's 
to. Oh, oh. seeing none. Oh, is, Je is that Jessica's hand up from before? All I see from the attendee side is Emily Har. So no hands up. Anyone from the board have any oh, announcements to make? Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, Vince is trying to get on right now. I guess he's have trouble, having trouble logging in, Fernanda. I don't know. Um, so uh, he's going to call in on the phone. Okay, so no more public hands up. So then we're going to go on to board member announcements. Now, is there anybody from the board who has an announcement? You have two minutes. I see one hand up, Gil Arevalo. Okay, Gil. Good evening. How are you doing? Hi, Gil. I have a couple, two, two items. Uh, number one, I'd like to see if we can take a pause uh, to recognize uh, the January 6th attack on our capital and the uh, officers, the law enforcement officers that lost their lives in it. If we can just take a moment for that. Okay. And, and secondly, uh, I uh, took my, uh, biased uh, training uh, yesterday and uh, got my certificate and everything else like that. Now, uh, Sarah, I don't know, uh, reading the training uh, there and what's required, uh, I saw uh, from our uh, council, there was like uh, five or six people that uh, had taken the bias training. And uh, according to what I read there, uh, you're not able to vote on anything unless you have had the bias training. So we can get a hearing on that or whether Jose is here that can uh, tell us that. Okay, uh, one second, uh, you can still comment. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but the Empower LA site with actually the training updates, it's, n it's not current. It's not always current. Okay, so uh, sorry I interrupted you, but if you want to continue. All right. Bill, thank you. Uh, any other board member announcements? Um, I have an announcement. All right, so yeah, the uh, anti-bias training, it was supposed to be done by January 1st. If you haven't done it, um, you must do it. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know your login, uh, email Jose Galdemez. Also, uh, and all planning and land use members must take uh, planning, planning 101. So it's a similar thing on Cornerstone. So you will have a, um, a password um, sent to you. Uh, yeah, just hit up Jose if you can't log in. It should be on your cornerstone all ready to go. And then I have one more announcement for the public. Metro is resuming fares on the trains and buses starting January 15th, I believe. Um, and my other announcement is uh, on New Year's, I, walked, I was walking down Broadway and I, I just want to say I uh, took count of there are nine street lights out between Avenue, between the Bank of America on Avenue 24 and Griffin at LeBlanc's. There's nine street lights out. So we're getting those replaced and fixed. So yeah, Broadway's been super dark. Uh, all right. And that's my announcement. Any other board members? Sarah, just one quick question. I'm on now. So I just want the record to show that I entered the meeting at. 616. All right, cool. And Vince, are you on your computer? No, I'm on a I'm on a, a cell phone, but okay. what do you need? Because we're gonna need somebody to do the screen sharing and stuff. I think Fernanda's not on the computer either. Okay. I can do it from the phone. You can? Okay, excellent. Because we have two presenters. Yeah. Okay, All I'll, right. I'll start setting it up now. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um Let's see. Uh, all right, so no more uh, board member announcements. Uh, we'll move on to Doodaloot. Sorry, everyone. Uh, government reports. Do we have anybody from the government in here? One second. Um, let's see. Oh, we have, okay. So uh, let's take uh, Cynthia Cruz. You have two minutes to speak. Hey, Cynthia Cruz. Fernanda, can you? Yep, I've unmuted her. 
Okay. Hi everyone. Can everyone hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. I'm um so yes, hi everyone. I'm Cynthia. I'm from CD14. But I also have on the meeting um the rest of our team. Um so Julio's on here and I believe Steven, if he can be muted as well or how oh. that works. But we just all wanted to introduce ourselves. Okay. So I guess. Um, I'll start. Um, my name is Cynthia Cruz. I'm the field deputy for El Sereno um, and now uh, Lincoln Heights, the portion of Lincoln Heights that's in CD14. Um, so we just wanted to jump on here to introduce ourselves and just share a couple of, I mean, we just, we're just starting to so just share anything new, whatever, what, what we have going on so far and just some information about how you guys can reach us and all of that stuff. And on here, like I said, is also Julio and Steven, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Julio and Steven, so it's Cynthia, Julio, and Steven from CD14. Mm -hmm. Sarah, um, yep. is, is Stevenson, is his last number ending in 046? So I can unmute him. Steven, two, 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 two. Oh, no, I see him down here. It's Steven R. Steven. Yeah, it's Steven Rodriguez. Okay, Steven. give me one second and I'll unmute him. Thank you for coming today. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, he's unmuted. Hi, Steven. Hello, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Nice meeting y'all. Uh, my name is Steven Rodriguez. I am the constituent service deputy right here for El Sereno and now Lincoln Heights or our portion of it. Um, I'm usually the first person you'll talk to if you call the office and, you know, just excited to meet y'all and work with y'all and that's, that's all. Um, Stefan, we're going to unmute you. Sorry, Stefan, for the cutout. Steven. Steven, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I don't know where I left off. I think, I don't know where everyone heard of me, but pleasure to meet y'all. Um, yeah. I, 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 should I just repeat everything again? I'm the constituent service deputy. Um, so I'm usually the first person I'll pick up the phone when you guys call the office. Um, and just looking forward to you know working with you on learning more about the community. So, <laughs> Steven, can can you please give the public and board members your your number and your email? Yeah, of course. So that's going to be the office number three two three two two six sixteen forty six. And then as for my email, it's going to be format Stephen S T E P H E N period F period Rodriguez. R O D R I G U E Z at alleycity.org. Cool. And then Stephen, could you, like with the redistricting, um, I just have a question. Um, so now the uh, borderline, right? It used to be at Main Street and now it's going up through Hancock, up through Flat Top and stuff. So our neighborhood's kind of 50 50, CD1 mm -hmm. and CD14. Yeah. When, is, when does that begin? January 1st. <laughs> so it already started, huh? All right. Yes. And I think you guys actually are more than 50%. You're like probably 70, 70% or something. something like right. that, yeah. <laughs> first, so here we are, CD14, Lincoln Heights. Uh, thank you, Steven. And then we had one more presenter for uh, Julio from CD14. Okay, Julio Torres, I'm unmuting you. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Julio. Hi, Madam President, board members. Uh, I'm circling back. Um, I uh, did introduce myself back in November. Um, so we're back with the team that just provided their, um, their contact info. Um, just like Cynthia mentioned, she, is, she will be the uh, field deputy for the area there. Um, and um, anything that, any issues or any uh, requests or services can be uh, uh, done through her or to Stephen or myself. Um, my contact information, my email is julio.torres at lacity.org. Mm -hmm. So we're, 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 um, we're about to bring some services out to our areas in terms of um, uh, sanitation, uh, some power washing, some bulky item pickup uh, through a dedicated crew through the LA Conservation Corps. So that's going to be happening uh, every Wednesdays. 
So if you have an area that needs attention, please reach out to our office so we can uh, make sure the area is cleaned. Uh, we do have uh, a feature of food giveaways um, and also some pop-up, additional pop-up COVID testing uh, uh, sites in, in our area. So we would like to uh, provide you with that information as we, we get that so you can help us share and get it out to the, um, the residents. Um, but just wanted to come and, and say hello once again and um, hope uh, to uh, continue this uh, collaboration with the Naval Council and uh, the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. All right. Let's see, do we have any more government officials? We have Jose Galdemez from Dunk. Uh, uh, hi, good evening. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Galdemez with the Department of Nubian Empowerment. Uh, so just uh, have a brief report. Uh, first off is uh, uh, with uh, bylaws. Again, bylaws amendment period will be in, uh, it's on April 1st, which is the deadline. So if the neighbor council is considering to make any amendments to your bylaws, uh, please start considering those and uh, in order to take action and, and submit the, the application be, before that deadline uh, comes, uh, gets closer. Uh, also, one of the other things too that's uh, uh, ongoing right now and also that the, at, at Bunk uh, with the Board of Neighbor Commissioners is the digital communications uh, policy. Uh, the draft commission uh, policy is being uh, it's going to be considered uh, for fraction, hopefully by March. So at this point, I know the commissioners have been asking for neighbor councils to put their input uh, in regards to the draft policy. Uh, the draft policy is available on the EmpowerLate.org website under the commissions tab. If you can see the under policies, uh, proposed policies, uh, draft policies, uh, you can see the 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 draft for the digital communications and the amended, the proposed amendments for the uh, code of conduct, which is still ongoing. Uh, but for the digital communications uh, policy, again, uh, if the neighbor council has yet to weigh in, uh, please uh, you know, try to agendize in the future to, to uh, uh, weigh in and comment on the policy itself. Uh, any comments or so that you would like to communicate to the commission. Um, for the uh, other updates is uh, in regards to the question that was brought up earlier regarding the ABLE training, uh, we will defer over to the neighbor council bylaws, uh, article 14 compliance section two for your trainings on how uh, it affects your board members. Uh, if they have not complied with, with the with the trainings that, that are required for, for them. Um, also, one more thing is that uh, for the planning 101, again, if uh, for any plum members, please make sure to take a training. Uh, if you haven't, it's available on Cornerstone. Uh, those that are stakeholders as well, if you receive your credentials, please go to Cornerstone, take training uh, there. Uh, if you've taken it in the past, uh, in 2020, uh, when it was the live sessions with the planning department and also with the Department of Navy Department. Uh, if you attended one of those sessions, we'll have a record. Uh, we'll just have to uh, look back and, and confirm. And, and if, if that's the case, please let the uh, rosters and Empower League know that you know, you've taken the training prior and, uh, don't, you don't, so that you don't have to take it again uh, through Cornerstone. Uh, that way you'll get credited for it. Um, also, I'd like to introduce, uh, I had like, you know, Raul uh, Preciado, uh, one of the new NEAs that was hired on uh, in, uh, in has been uh, hired on with the department this past, I believe, November. <laughs> and he's been shadowing uh, some of the NEAs uh, and also just uh, eager to, to uh, start going, uh, attending some of the neighborhood councils as well. Uh, also, we have uh, Erica Gatica as, as well. Um, if you could allow them just to introduce themselves. <laughs> uh, I believe they're in the team. 
All right, so Erica and Raul. Yeah. Jose. Vince, do you see Erica and Raul on the attendee side? I see Erica and Raul. Okay, cool. Vince? Yes, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Raul. All right. Hi, hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. Just want to say it's it's great to to be you know a part of this department and, and get to <coughs> witness a lot of the, the work that the neighborhood councils do. Uh, this is the first time that I attend this neighborhood council, but I'm excited to, uh, to be a part of it. So thank you and I hope we have a good meeting. Great, thank you, Raul. And Erica? Hello everyone, my name is Erica Gatica. Unlike Raul, I started in December, so just last month, late last month specifically. I um, grew up in Northeast Los Angeles, um, specifically Cypress Park neighborhood. And I also attended the neighborhood council meetings there. So that's where I really started to gain my passion for the community. Thank you all for having me and I'm um, looking forward to this meeting. Thank you. Cool. All right, sorry guys, I'm an issue. Thank you, Erica. Um, all right, so uh, are those our government officials? So it's CD14 and then done, right? All right, any other hands up? So we'll move to item number blue. Hey, Sarah, just before moving on to the items, please make sure you oh. take for the public. What's that? Uh, please make sure to take for public comment on, on the items. Oh yeah, but this isn't an item. This is just uh, government reports, right? Yeah, uh, just still able to make public comment. That's why. <laughs> oh. Okay, so in that case, we do have one public comment, and that's a goat puppet. Okay, let me get my timer up. All right. Uh, sorry, guys. Okay, goat puppet. Are we ready with the timer? I'll get the timer up on the next one. All right. You got to go in, Sarah? Just let me know. Yes, and, I uh, do. Okay, goat puppet, please take your name for the record. <laughs> yes, goat puppet 22, happy nigger. <laughs> Yes, so we have not one, not two, but three NAAs here tonight. <laughs> what, what happened? Well, they're they're talking about that free speech stuff again. Yes, apparently somebody filed a legal claim about signing up at meetings and being discriminated because of their name or their gender <laughs> they use. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. So again, all you new NAAs, there are three things you need to do. Get lots of tongues, take lots of coffee breaks, and number three, complain to Raquel Beltran that she is a bad manager. <laughs> and then you could wind up like Simi Park and get a promotion to do absolutely nothing and make 180,000 a year. That's your goal. That's no puppet's goal. And everybody on this board's goal is to become a city employee one day, a real one. And finally, unfortunately, the trial of scarcity versus the city of LA has been delayed another month. Oh, come on. Yes, that's right. Because the city attorney is trying to say that you board members are not city employees. No puppet supports your right to be a city employee. He wants you to have collective bargaining and minimum wage and back pay and damages for not giving you overtime past 530. It's time to make you all paid city employees and welcome you to the city family because you work harder than anybody in Gil Sedillo's office. Finally, welcome CD14. We love you over here. <laughs> and give us our office space back that Gil stole from the neighborhood council. The chair will talk to you more about that right now. <laughs> thank you, Go Puppet. That's your time. Two minutes there. All right, thank you. And then uh, any nope. more, uh, public comments on the government reports? No, we have no more. Okay, so any board member comments on the government reports? Not seeing any. All right, so we will move on to the next item. Uh, now, we'll move on to item number six, committee announcements. So 
the chairs from any committees, if you, we're not gonna go committee by committee. We're just gonna like, if you have an announcement about your committee, like if you have a projected date for your meeting or whatever, just, uh, yeah, uh, let me know. Let's see. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand, do you? Just speak. No, we got uh, Selena. Selena. Hi, uh, yeah, sorry everyone, can you hear me? Yes. yes can. Good evening, everyone. So I know that uh, elections and um, city government liaison was supposed to meet at the end of December, but I had a, a medical family emergency. Um, so that's why um, that agenda was never posted or anything. But um, elections uh, will be meeting for our next uh, board meeting. Um, city and government liaison will have to be at an end. Okay. And elections, yeah, that has to do with the upcoming CD1 uh, council elections, right? Yes, yes, that's why, that's why I have more of an urgency to meet for that committee. And can you describe uh, what, ha what, what happens at Town Hall ETC? Um, what do you mean? I mean, um, just for those, for board members and stuff, so about... For instance, uh, yeah, there are upcoming city council's elections that are going to occur at a, on a certain date. We um, host a town hall, right? Yeah, we we host a town hall, and uh, the candidates. I mean, it's customary that they come, and you know, they kind of introduce themselves, um, and then uh, stakeholders can also come and ask questions, and you know, uh, kind of speak to one another, and yeah. So then, yeah, CD14, oh wait, CD1 and who else? Uh, yeah, Lincoln Heights. So either CD14 is not, anyway, whatever. Uh, yeah, so we host a town hall, uh, a debate. Yes. So, yes, and uh, we're, we are, uh, you know, the rule is we're supposed to have uh, Zoom meetings until March. I don't know if it's gonna be extended, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see. All right, thank you, Selena. So I made note of that. Um, any other uh, chairs of entities that want to make an announcement? I'll make one, Sarah. The Sustainability Committee, we're planning to have our meeting towards the end of it. Uh, I know we have committee members on here now, so you'll be getting an email from me so we can uh, figure out the agenda and the date, and then we'll get it out. But we do plan to meet uh, this month, the end of this month. All right, cool. And then Vince, what's your email if people want to get in touch with you, if, if any uh, community members want to join the committee of the Sustainability Committee? My email is uh, Vincent, V-I-N-C-E-N-T -E uh, M dot L-H-N-C at gmail.com. All right, thank you. And then Selena, what's your email in case anybody from the community or the public wants to join the Elections Committee? Oh, wait, can you choose Selena's hand? Selena? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah. So if anybody wants to get a hold of you from the community and they want to join the elections committee and be- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Selena dot Leakin, L-H-N-C dot uh, at gmail.com, sorry. Excellent, thank you, Selena. Um, I have to say- okay, Oh, I'm the chair of the Planning and Land Use Committee. We're going to have a Planning and Land Use Committee meeting in the next uh, week. All right. Uh, and that's it. That's my announcement. Uh, the LGBTQ um, uh, uh, neighbor Neighborhood Alliance Council should be meeting sometime this month. I don't know when, but I'll let you guys know if um, we find out. I mean, if I find out before next, uh, by next meeting. All right. Yeah. That, so that's Diana. That, that's the LGBT. Uh, uh, liaison. Um, Diana, what's your email in case anybody wants to join that? Well, wants to be a liaison as well? Uh, Diana dot n h n c dot tran t r a n at gmail.com. Cool. And then if anybody from the community wants to join the planning and use committee, my email is sarah s a r a dot l h n c at proton mail proton mail. Dot com. Cool. Any other committee uh, chairs have any announcements? Let's see. Uh, participants. No committee chairs. All right. So we'll move on to the next item. All right. Announcement of LHNC vacancies. 
All right, so I'm gonna make this announcement. Vince, can you pull up our, uh, our uh, supplementary files for today's meeting? This one's a fresh one. All right, so uh, all of our supplementary files, supplemental documents for today's meeting are available at uh, our website, lincolnheightsnc.org slash agendas. Um, and then you'll see the uh, supporting documents. So we, right now, the council has eight available seats open, eight positions, um, two business reps, area one at large, area two resident, area three at large, area four resident, area six resident, and area seven resident. Vince, can you scroll down a little? So uh, there's the boundary map of Lincoln Heights. That's the official city boundary of Lincoln Heights that so many people fought for. Uh, so you can see where the districts or areas are. Um, and uh, yeah, and then yeah, the, the, the following uh, items in this PDF have like more of a description of what the requirements are. So yeah, any applicants, you uh, send your um, send an inquiry to our secretary Fernanda Sanchez, uh, Fernanda dot Sanchez, lhnc at gmail dot com. We need eight board members. Excellent, and we have a board of twenty five. So thank you very much. And um, and has have we sub, have we received any applications for vacant seats, uh, Vince or Fernie, Fernanda? I, I have not received any in my email. Really have I. But uh, once you submit an application, it will be uh, up for vote at the following general board meeting. And we hold general board meetings twice a month, first and third Thursday. All right, let's see. Eight, we're going to table number eight uh, of the, uh, Number eight, uh, discussion of possible action on approval of board minutes for December 16, 2021 general meeting. We're gonna table that or postpone it to the next meeting. Number nine, funding items. Uh, we're gonna, Vince, you haven't received the MER, correct? No, we don't We don't have it, so we'll, we'll continue to next month. Yeah, we're gonna continue that to the next month. So uh, item 10, presentations. Vince, can you pull up, um, we're gonna, yeah, okay, so presentations. A, subject Avenue 34 project update regarding undisclosed 1984 landmark toxic dumping case. Vince, can you click on uh, supporting document? Uh, yeah, that one. All right. Sorry if it's too small for you guys to see, but uh, so there's the new news. And we have a presenter, a one presenter Michael Hayden of Lincoln Heights Community Coalition. Um, here with us. Vince, can you move him over to panelists to speak? I have allowed him to speak. Okay, thank you, Fernanda. And then he also will, will need to sh maybe share a screen as well. And uh, I'm gonna read uh, item 10A2, uh, description. Recent community discovery of undisclosed contaminants at 141 West Avenue 34 site, the Avenue 34 project site. 254 barrels of toxic waste were buried at the site in 1984, and the case was prosecuted by the city. Yet the city of LA and DPSC do not have that on record. They don't have a record of it. The 1984 investigation, <laughs> investigation and prosecution was headed by the DAs. Well, it, was a, it was a joint prosecution. Uh, the, 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 top, the LA, Los Angeles, Toxic Waste Strike Force. Los Angeles Toxic Waste Strike Force headed, spearheaded the investigation and the prosecution. And it was the first time that a, 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 a polluter, a business owner was sent to jail for polluting, uh, for dumping toxins. Uh, community discussion. Uh, Michael Hayden, are you here with us? Vince? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Um, can you guys see me? I can't see myself. So good. I'm so dark in here. Yes, we can see you. Okay. Hey. Hold up. Um, Looking good. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. Thank you, Michael. Hi. Um, so, I, my name is Michael Hayden. I live on Avenue 34 across the street from where this project is supposed to be built. 
And I can summarize some of the developments at the Avenue 34 site since uh, the last neighborhood council meeting. So um, as most of you are probably aware, DTSC hosted a public meeting on December 1st. Um, and lots of people from the community showed up for that meeting. And um, I just want to share some answers from DTSC that I thought were a little bit troubling. Um, one of those is people asked, why have we not determined the boundaries of the contamination, um, which would necessitate testing off the property borders, which they have not done. And DTSC said that testing offsite can get messy because they don't want to run into somebody else's plume. Um, in other words, they said they don't want to find contamination, even if it's there. They also said that um, somebody asked why they aren't requiring more stringent cleanup measures. And DTSC said that whatever they require has to give value for the expense it costs to the developer. So in other words, they're basing their decisions on costs to the developer and not impacts to the community. Um, and then uh, I, in fact, asked a question why they aren't investigating the sewers and if their failure to do that is um, neglecting DTSC's own guidance documents, which they're required to follow, they didn't answer my question. Um, people asked about, um, neighbors asked about what health impacts were being subjected to, and they couldn't answer those questions because DTSC has not conducted a health risk assessment despite two of their own scientists making that recommendation months ago. So um, at, uh, just after that meeting, um, this information became available to the public that in 1984, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the LA Toxic Waste Strike Force discovered 254 55 gallon barrels of toxic waste like buried in cavernous holes across. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're kind of a little Is bit. Is it spotty? But uh, Vince, can you pull up the, uh, can you go back to the supplemental supplementary files and pull up the one with the image? All right, it's called, uh, item 10 a uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. it's the one no not that one go back it's got an image um, don't, don't click until I find it um, go down okay keep going down it says intentional waste dump found in LA go up up down 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 there you go intentional waste dump yeah click on that so this is a compilation of all the press that was discovered. Uh, of this site, and this is from 1984 to 1980. <clears throat> and uh, Vince, if you, can you scroll up and down a little? So, uh, Michael, you can DJ Vince. Yeah. Vince so this is the ad that the prosecutors forced the um, polluters to purchase in the LA Times, full-page ads at a cost of like fifteen thousand dollars, to advertise what they had done, what their punishments were and the address where this happened. You can see there, it says 141 West Avenue 34. Um, and it says, uh, intentional clandestine acts of illegal disposal of hazardous waste or midnight dumping are violent crimes against the community. Um, we are paying the price. Today, while you read this ad, our president and vice president are serving time in jail and we were forced to place this ad. Please take the legal alternative and protect our environment. Um, so, in fact, th this is the only reason, and here are some LA Times stories from 1984 and um, about the incident, and this is the only reason that we actually know about this because um, these records aren't apparently being held by the city or the state or all the relevant agencies that should be hanging on to these records, making them part of the public, public documents. Um, four people were arrested for this pollution. Um, they were sentenced up to six months in jail, $20,000 fine. Um, it was described as, a, as an egregious and intentional toxic dump. Um, the fact that this history hasn't been included in the developers' applications to city planning, their environmental review, their phase one environmental site assessment, um, in any of the record searches, in, you know, California has very strict laws about making these kinds of disclosures um, to property buyers when you sell a property that's impacted by environmental um, impacts like this. So that all suggests that 
uh, many people have worked over decades to hide and obscure this information. Um, honestly, there's no way for DTSC to say honestly that they have completed a site characterization at this time. Um, and a site characterization is obviously a prerequisite for approving a cleanup plan. Therefore, um, it would be completely inappropriate for DTSC to approve this cleanup plan or their site characterization until more investigation is done. Some of our previously stated concerns like the impact on the sewer and how that sewer connects to Hillside Elementary and homes across the street are now even more important to investigate because we know that for at least four years, these polluters were dumping toxins directly into the sewers and they can just leach out of leaks and holes in the sewers into the soil. Um, there's no saying how far they could travel. They, they could travel, you know, the, as, as far as possible. Um, and and so, um, so that issue becomes even more critical than it was when we originally raised it with DTSC. Um, it also means there are other unanswered questions. For instance, the polluters were occupying the property from 1964 to, 19, to about 1999 or 2000. Um, and this pollution was caught in 1984, but the building was built in 1977. It's completely conceivable that the polluters buried other pollution barrels of toxic waste, who knows what, under the site where they built the large warehouse that's still there today. And it's possible that wasn't recovered in 1984 when they did this cleanup. I, I should also mention that the cleanup described in these newspaper stories is described as having lasted um, probably less than 12 hours because it happened in the afternoon until two in the morning um, that same night. In other words, they did not clean it up to any of the modern standards that would make the site clean. And of course, that's borne out by the testing that happened this year that shows how polluted the site is. But it also raises the question, if the developers developed this testing plan themselves and developed this cleanup plan themselves, did they have advanced knowledge about this history? And did they in fact design a, an investigation and a cleanup plan that would be uh, favorable to them and reveal as little contamination as possible. That's something that DTSC needs to investigate. Um, also, uh, you know, we've, we've compared DTSC's cleanup plan and their soil removal plan to the developers' plans as stated in their geological report and their report to city planning. And their report to city planning describes some 90,000 cubic yards of soil removal. DTSC's only describes 24,500, something like that. So it's about a quarter of what they actually plan to excavate. And DTSC says they're gonna excavate to a depth of 20 feet. The developers and their documents with the city say they're gonna, um, they're excavating to a depth of 40 feet. So, so that leaves open the possibility that if DTSC were to approve this cleanup plan as it's written, DTSC would only be on site for a quarter of the actual excavation. And, and that just is indefensible now that we know this history of the site um, and the fact that there may be other pollution and maybe other barrels of toxic waste even still buried under this site. Um, now, this all happened just before DTSC's December 20th public comment period. Um, so in that week, in just a few days um, between the time of that meeting with DTSC, this information coming out in the public and the closure of that public comment period. Um, I wrote a letter to DTSC as well as other neighbors. Um, lots of people um, I know weighed in on DTSC's plan uh, saying that it wasn't enough of an investigation and wasn't enough of a cleanup. We also had a letter written by Jim Wells, who's uh, one of the top geologists in California and um, was the geologist weighing in on the Exide cleanup. Um, and he wrote a, an expert opinion on this cleanup saying that you know, it doesn't address all the contamination nearly well enough, that all this history from 1984 leaves lots of unanswered questions that DTSC doesn't acknowledge in their investigation. Hilda Solis, our county supervisor, also wrote a letter, um, actually just before this information came into the public. So she was not aware of this history, but despite not knowing that history of the toxic dumping, 
she weighed in on this saying that the DTSC plan was not thorough enough of an investigation, did not adequately describe what the risks to the community were, um, and also stated her disturbance at the developer's behavior um, throughout the past year and a half now. Um, uh, the office of Jimmy Gomez, our US representative, also told us that he submitted a letter to DTSC, um, also stating that not enough of investigation had been done and that a higher cleanup standard needed to be applied than the one that was being applied. Um, and additionally, the United States Environmental Protective Agency, the EPA, weighed in on this also. They um, we had a meeting with them where they echoed many of our concerns that we brought to them. They met with Hilda Solis and Jimmy Gomez and, and um, agreed that our concerns were valid and encouraged them to write letters to DTSC echoing those concerns. Um, and then of course, we've had multiple stories come out in the press, the Capitol and Maine story. There was also one in City Watch. Um, so this is, something that this public is starting to become aware of. Um, so far, there hasn't been any reply from DTSC. I was in contact with Hilda Solis's office just two days ago, which said, although they've reached out to DTSC, they have not heard a response yet from them. Um, and the most recent development just today is that the Department of City Planning has taken down all the files connected to this project. Um, and Ooh. I just have to say that this is a hugely consequential history for a hugely consequential project in a neighborhood um, that already is overburdened by pollution impacts. And anybody who is helping to hide this danger to the community is continuing the original crime and needs to be held accountable. Um, Michael, um, how much more time do you think you'll need? I, th I think that's it. Um, I just wanna say, yeah, um, Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council, we emailed uh, the city with all of our uh, official actions on this subject, Avenue 34, uh, four or five documents of our community impact statements and letters, um, especially regarding the, uh, the illegal cancellation of the sequel appeal. Um, we, in that letter, we also uh, suggested that we made a request that city planning um, link all of the, the uh, case files for the for this case uh for the avenue 34 case on their uh, website subsequently uh now yeah, now the one key element the 2016 vince can you go back onto the previous page the 2016 environmental the the mitigated negative declaration environmental report let's see keep uh let's see uh go down 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 down, down, down. keep going Keep going, that one, click on it. This item is now missing from city planning's website. Now this is the, Mike, Michael, do you wanna continue on this, what this document is? Sure, this is the environmental review that was prepared in 2016 for the first version of this project. Um, the developers that are developing the proposal now used the same environmental review. They did an amendment to it, but it doesn't make much consequential difference. Um, and this environmental review does not identify any of this history. And in fact, you know, we filed two appeals back, uh, well, one appeal that had two hearings against the City Planning Commission back in 2020, based primarily on this document, because this document omits um, publicly available information and, and impacts on the site that should have been included. Um, but most significantly, when you come down to the section on hazardous substances, it only lists uh, lead paint in the buildings as the likely hazardous substance on the property. And at the same time that, that we were filing these appeals based largely on this document, um, the developers were representing um, at public meetings, in private, in email correspondence, and on their website that they had tested the site and that it had shown that there was no contamination on the property. We now know that that was all a lie. They had not tested for contamination, um, or if they had, they have not released that to the public. And they definitely would have found that it was hugely contaminated because there's contamination in the 
in the soil, in the groundwater, in the soil vapors across the entire property at very high levels. Um, so this this was the environmental uh, mitigated negative declaration for the previous Avenue 34 project uh, submitted. This so this was submitted on 20 in 2016. Now this previous project was way smaller than the existing project or than the new project of 2019. That's right. But then they yeah. based basically they based they, they let them use this MNG for this new project, which is considerably larger. Um, this initial 2016 MND was submitted. The applicants were Eric Ortiz, the property owner, ED1125 LLC. And then um, the lobbyist was uh, Dave, Dana Sales of DBA360. And then the uh, applicant was Steve Bing of Shangri-La, Shangri-La Industries. Um, strangely enough, uh, DBA 360, Dana Sales lobbying firm was purchased or bought up by Mitch Englander's uncle's uh, lobbying firm. And uh, the whole thing is this project from 2016 was just sort of tabled. It was just canceled for in 2018, right? Mike, Michael, can you? Yeah, that? yeah, it never got built. I'm unclear as to the reasons why it didn't, but I also know that the city planning approval of this project expired before city planning approved the new project. And that's something else that the developers have said constantly in public meetings. In fact, at the city planning commission appeal hearings in some, in, uh, in, um, I guess the last one was in October of 2020, they continued to say that they could build this project at any moment. And they were sort of holding that up as a threat as if like, if you, if you don't let us build the other one, we're just gonna build this other one anyway. But even when they were saying that at that appeal hearing, this project had already expired because they had um, waited longer than three years to, to start building. Um, thank you, Michael. Vince, can you go back to the previous window? And there's one more final thing, I guess. Um, so the strange thing about this parcel is that it's, it's excluded from the cast, the Cornfield Arroyo uh, specific plan. So uh, let's see which document it is. Um, ordinance, okay, go up, Vince. Okay, wait, down, 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 down one more. That one, click on that. So the reason, now this is a 2006 uh, ordinance the reason it's excluded from the Cornfield Arroyo specific plan is, can you scroll down Ben? Is that, so the city of LA had identified key sites in 2006 that were in proximity to the Heritage Square Gold Line Station. Strangely enough, these key sites are the sites that are being developed now for TOCs like Nela Plaza and like Avenue 34. So what you're looking at right here is Nela Plaza's proposed site, but this was made in 2006. And now this document lets them build taller uh, and, and the more dense. Um, so what we can, what one can conclude from this information, Michael, is that uh, this has actually been in the works for a long time. Absolutely. And another detail that I would like to add is that um, this document that you have up on the screen right now, um, uh, you know, includes the, the provision that DTSC give oversight and approval for any testing on this project, on this, on this parcel, on this specific parcel, which is kind of unusual in the city for the city to require state oversight for development within the city. And um, in the documents in the city council file related to this document, um, one of those documents cites, uh, so there you go, that's the that's the parcel. This is, no, wait, go down, that, that's the Welch's site. Oh this yeah, there you go. No, the, the last one was actually. Oh, really? No, yeah. oh, that's the so whole- You'll see they combine them as one parcel. Oh yeah, um, oh. Treating them together. Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, in the council file for the, you know, approving this document, it cites uh, another environmental review from 2006, which should be attached in city planning's website to this same parcel because it was used as the basis for saying that DTSC needs to approve testing on the site. Um, but that environmental review is not on city planning's website also. I haven't been able to locate a copy of it. And I'm very curious what it would say because obviously it's 
it shows knowledge on the part of the city that this site was, um, was contaminated or was likely to be contaminated and that the city could not allow any construction on this property without first having testing by DTSC. Um, and that's a key point that the developers tried to evade and city planning tried to evade and which we um, have pushed to this point. And of course now we're trying to make sure that that testing is, is adequate and honest. And you know, in the uh, EIRs for other projects like the Metro Gold Line and like this, the 710 freeway EIR, uh, so th these are from before, they had actually identified the Avenue 34 parcel and the parcel above it. You know, the parcel above it is like a renowned toxic site, uh, but, but they had identified the Avenue 34 site. They had uh, not only recommended, but they stressed the need for um, a uh, phase two uh, GTSC, uh, right, uh, sub whatever, investigation. Yeah. And then yeah. fast forward to 20, 2019 or 2020 for, you know, they're saying like, oh, we don't need it. We need, don't need any testing at all, you know? Uh, Sarah, we have Sarah Swan in. I think she should weigh it. I don't know if she okay, wants yeah, to. Yeah, so um, Jessica Swan, well, this is uh, D the EPA, DGSC, uh, we want to have an unbiased dialogue here. We have Michael here, community member with the org. Let's have uh, Jessica come in. Um, and uh, yeah, so Jessica. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if she, if she wants, I just, I mean, she we can yeah. just continue, yeah. I just, I just don't know who the, like the parties are. I mean, it's like we have the city of LA is who we're talking about really. And then DTSC, uh, it's kind of another element, but. Um, if okay. Jessica wants to talk, yeah, of course. Hi, good evening, everyone. Actually, I did have my hand raised, so I, I do. Oh. Is that, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. oh gosh, okay. Um, okay, um, so starting off, so DTSC is conducting an inquiry based on the historical news articles to verify the veracity of the cleanup that was done. Um, and so under this was done under the oversight of the, as was discussed under the oversight of the Los Angeles city and county combined um, team, the hazardous waste task force. So the investigation included, oh, okay. So, Hold on just a second. So the articles indicate that the barrels were buried on a Union Pacific Railroad lot that is next to Avenue 34 and not on the site itself. So I wanna make that clear about the barrel, where the barrels were found. It says that in the article. The articles also indicate that, the, um, that there was a speedy cleanup done and they were transported to the BKK landfill in West Covina. So DTSC conducted soil vapor surveys at the Avenue 34 site as a part of the normal investigation process and xylene and toluene and other VOCs were subject that um, were subject to the investigation. So these were the chemicals that were identified in the articles. Um, so they have been tested for on the property um, and it was, we've, so the investigation did not identify any offsite sources of contamination. There was an onsite sort of source of contamination that was found, has been identified and is in the site cleanup document or the RAW, the removal action work plan. So that is available for everyone's re review. You can see where underneath at the 141 Avenue 34 site um, that there is a plume of contamination under there and we have identified that. So uh, DTSC has concluded that based on the site investigation that the data has been collected and is sufficient to characterize the site for both evaluating the potential for risk to human health and for the purposes of developing a cleanup plan. So I, and I just wanna go back really quickly um, the boundaries of the contamination has been identified. The cleanup standards for this project are, the goals are for residential cleanup standards. 
soil um, adjacent to the sewer lines has been tested for soil, the soil gas and soil has been tested around the sewers that we, that we continue to talk about. Um, a health risk assessment, a part, one has been done in the raw, and that is to determine who might be at risk for contamination at the site. So that includes neighbors and workers, as well as potential future residents. And so those help us determine what the cleanup goals will be based on the final use of the property, based on the intended use of the, of the property. Um, so the reason that folks have not received a response is because those all of those comments were made under the public comment period and a, a full response to comments document will be produced to respond to all of those comments. Um, and I believe that's all I have. So, and I can answer questions if that's uh, reasonable in this time frame. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um, I, can't. I have a question. Uh, can you tell me what year DTSC uh, was founded or was started? 1991. Okay, 1991, and then this was in 1987. Um, or 1984, sorry, my bad, uh, with the strike force. Um, yeah, uh, any, Michael, do you have a question? Or yeah, you? so um, the, the first news article that I found about this said that, the, um, that they identified this activity at the corner of Pasadena Avenue and Avenue 34. And so I would say that if you found something that indicated otherwise that, um, and also that they found multiple sites where they were burying stuff across the property, which would seem to dispute the characterization that it was just at the rail yard on the other side of the rail. Um, the, the news stories definitely support the, the, uh, the fact that it was buried on this property. Um, uh, furthermore, um, you know, the cleanup that was described in those stories was uh, that the barrels were taken to BKK landfill, but it also described that the barrels had been so corroded by their contents that no barrel had more than five gallons of liquid left in them, which means that thousands of gallons of toxic waste spilled into the soil. Um, another thing that you said was that the boundaries have been identified. And I guess if by that you mean that the boundaries of the contamination stops at the boundaries of the property. Um, I don't know how you can confirm that that's the case unless you've tested beyond the boundaries and found an absence of contamination. But to my knowledge, you have not done that. So I don't know how you can support the argument that you've identified the boundaries of the contamination because you've tested at the boundaries of the property and there's still contamination there. And furthermore, um, you said that soil gas has been tested next to the sewers. I'd like to point out that, that in the first draft of the raw, it said that the soil gas next to the sewers was probably due to um, contamination leaking out from the sewers. We raised this point and said that this should be grounds for testing along the sewers as the sewer leaves the property. And in the second version of the raw, without offering any explanation, it changed that language to no longer say this was due to contamination from the sewers. But with this new information that's coming out, that at the Avenue 34 property at 141 West Avenue 34, for at least four years, they were dumping contamination into the sewers, supports our argument that the sewers need to be investigated and that it was not just at the rail yard on the other side of the railroad tracks that contamination was happening. Um, furthermore, you know, you say that there has been a human health risk assessment due to the sentences you just repeated saying that neighbors are at risk. Uh, we know we're at risk, um, but we don't know how much we're at risk. And two different DTSC scientists have said that a standalone human health risk assessment needs to be prepared. Um, so far that has not been prepared. And there's only a couple of vague sentences that, that let us know that we're endangered, but don't let us know what kind of danger we're in or what degree of danger. And that's what we're demanding. Um, one second. So across the street is Hillside Elementary School. Jessica, could you tell me how many students are uh, enrolled at Hillside Elementary School? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. So, uh, Michael, uh, has any uh, 
So what are the, uh, so Hillside Elementary? What's what's the uh, ang what's their uh, angle on this? Are you asking me? Yeah, or DTSC, I guess. Uh, Jessica, what is? Uh, have you uh, received any? Uh, have you been uh, communicating with Hillside Elementary School? We have been communicating with the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, I believe the title is environmental. I'm I can't remember the title, but it's Lawrence Brown, um, and he works for the the Los Angeles Unified School District, and that is our communication point. All right. Um, yeah, and I, I just no, no, we, have, the, we have board members that have their that have their hands up. Okay, uh, Michael, if you want to make the final statement, you. Oh, just as far as Hillside goes, I've had um, a conversation with Carlos Torres, who's the director of environmental and uh, human safety or something like that at uh, LAUSD. And he's indicated that although they have not done any investigation at Hillside, if DTSC determines that it's advisable that um, they would take the lead from DTSC. So um, just uh, wanna put that out there in case DTSC says they're getting any pushback from from Hillside because um, I know according to the Director of Health and Safety at LAUSD that that's not the case. All right. Thank okay. you, Michael. <clears throat> we got um, Fernanda. Fernanda? Hi, uh, just a couple of things. Um, so I remember clearly uh, DTSC stating during the last presentation that they had that they didn't really have concerns over offsite contamination. And it's been brought up right now about the boundaries. Um, but DTSC just confirmed that the barrels were adjacent to the property and therefore should further the boundaries of the contamination and therefore <laughs> the offsite um, contamination needs to be clearly considered. Um, and I also want to point out the investigation that DTSC just mentioned regarding those barrels. If DTSC has done tests and investigation about the buried barrels, did this happen before or after that article was just released um, indicating that we, the community just found out about these barrels? Because if, that, if those investigations were done before this article was just released this past week, then why didn't you disclose to our community that there are barrels buried in, on this site? Um, the tone and lack of urgency that has been continuously expressed by DTSC is negligent and incredibly violent to our brown communities. Environmental racism is thriving in our communities here and everybody needs to know about this. Okay, so I, can I, can I, can I, uh, Vince, can you go back and then pull up the articles again? Thank you, everybody. We're, we're, we're gonna sum this up soon. Uh, not that one. It's the one of the historic articles. It says intentional waste dump, dump found in LA. Now uh, scroll up, keep going uh, to where, okay, so keep going, keep going, keep going, uh, keep going, keep going. Okay, go, go back down, stop. Uh, City Attorney Ira Reiner said the jailing of the American Castor Cor Corporation executives was the first such punishment in the state for industrial polluters, 1984. Vince, gonna scroll up again, or down, whatever, forward, stop. So here's the strike force task master. master. Uh, yeah, so Vince, as uh, Jessica's talking, can you kind of just scroll through these articles so people can just get a picture of it visually and psychologically? Okay. Jessica. And, just let, and just let people know, this is up on the supplemental income on the website. I mean, supplemental oh, uh, documents. Documents. Yeah, supplemental Not documents. what I've been working on before. LakenHeightsNC.org. A big fat, it's a bunch of supplemental documents here. Okay, so, Jessica, uh, if you want to respond to Fernanda. Yes, please. So I don't, I, I do want to clear up any confusion regarding the inquiry based on the articles versus the DTSC investigation. So the DT, DTSC investigation um, of xylene and toluene, those would have been included regardless. So we did not have prior knowledge of this article prior to doing the investigation, but because industrial solvents had been used on the property prior, that is why that indicates that we should be searching for certain chemicals, right? So that is why those chemicals were 
already included in the existing or in the investigations that we had earlier in 2021. Sorry, new year. Um, okay, so then as far as us figuring out what happened for the cleanup of this um, these barrels and, and what happened there and them going to those and, and potentially the soil going to BKK, that is what we are trying to investigate and figure out and see if there was confirmation sampling and things like that. So we are trying to, de to make, sh to determine if that happened, but going back to my statement, there was no offsite source of contamination found to be, to be coming onto the site. So again, the contamination plume is mostly under the 141 Avenue 34, and that consists of PCE and other chemicals. So um, I just wanted to clarify those two points that to- Sure. And then I just write really quickly from what you said that there was no knowledge about these articles. Um, in, and I'm assuming you're referring to the 252 barrels that were buried. Um, this is from the LA Times, like this is public information. This is your due diligence to find out about what is on this property. This shouldn't be up to the community who figured this out. That is your job. And if you didn't know about these articles, DTSC is being completely negligent. Thank you, Fernie. I'm gonna call on uh, Anna Lee because she's on the... Anna Lee, if you Anna can Lee? yourself. Timing everybody here. Start. Two minutes, Anna Lee. Okay, let me go to Diana. Uh, she's not responding, but let me go to uh, Diana. Hello. Oh, no, uh, I didn't. Oh, okay. Oh, Hold my on. God. Uh, go ahead, Anna Lee. No, my, hand is just up to you guys. my hand is up so you guys know who I am. That's all. But no, it's not raised. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Diana. okay, Diana Tram. Hello. Youth um, rep is our youth rep for Lincoln High Neighborhood Council from hello. LA Leadership. Hey. Um, so uh so there should be about 52, like 200 kids max at Hillside. I would know because I went there. I mean, yeah, it's changed since the, since then, but still. Um so um when uh, when I was trying to get uh schools inputs uh during the whole activism thing, right? Because I was a part of it. I tried to get into contact with Hillside and I, and I talked to the office lady that I knew there and somebody else, but what they said was that they weren't really able to talk about it because, um, you know, you have to go through LAUSD, so you can't really get an opinion from them anyway, it all has to go through LAUSD. Yeah, like in my school, we can do it because I go to Los Angeles Leadership Academy and we're a charter school. So you can get an opinion from my principal, I'm pretty sure, but not a school like Hillside, which is directly under the USD. Okay, and then uh, what has, has uh, DTSC gotten in touch with uh, uh, LA Lala? Academy on Avenue 33? I don't recall. I mean, my principal has a bunch of stuff on her board and it doesn't say anything about that. I mean, I can email her just to check, but from what I know, no. Okay, and then just so everybody knows, uh, Michael, how many um, how many schools are in proximity to uh, the site? Uh, by my count, there's uh, five. If you include um, LA Leadership Academy High School, and then a few blocks away, you have the middle school, elementary school. You've got Hillside Elementary School, and then you've got two just across the street. You've got the uh, Loretto and um, uh, Florence Nightingale, just uh, just across the highway um, on the other side of the. Oh, so right. just to clarify, do you want me to ask your principal if DTSC has reached out to her? Oh, it's okay. Okay. Uh, if you want to. Um, sure. So no, uh, I, think, I think do it to make a record of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I wanna, there's no more comments after this, but I can't raise my hand. So I want to make a comment. Okay, Vince. Um, you know, th th there's something sadder than what we're looking at right now. Sorry. It's the fact that DTSC is looking at a newspaper article for its information. Um, the news article itself says one thing, but the city has been destroying these documents for a long time. For those of us that have, have litigated some of these fights in court, um, one of the main problems is, is DTSC comes in and says, um, we're gonna do this based upon the information we have. They don't even hold a database. Since 91, they weren't required by design to hold a database. 
And that's, it's kind of contradictory to what their department is there for is to protect the health, safety and welfare of the public by into implementing these plans, right? We didn't have the standardization for it when they were created and when this problem happened. And what we're seeing today is that in, in the history, if DTS wants to take this straight to the books and look at the history, some of these areas are the old Duhaney field. Our whole city is contaminated. That means that these things have to be at a high level of, of uh, what they like to call mitigate uh, to fix the land. You're never going to cure it. That's why they don't use those words, because it's never going to get fixed. It's a percentage to how much they can try to make it as best as they can to fit within development. But most of those toxins probably went on the uh, underground water traveling into other places that contaminated other pockets. So the topography, the hydrology is very important to these cases. Most land, if not all in our area is contaminated and technically should not be disturbed. And we can see that in the city when they use readaptive reuse. It's the only reason why some of you exist in the community. You could never build this way. And Jessica, it's, it's the same thing like uh, uh, G1 and G2, Pasel del Rio Park, known historical toxic site. They only know the history of Taylor Yard and not the past history. And if, if they learn anything about this, the community is going to bring more documentation on the, the land contamination. But see, it, it goes regional. It's not just these two uh, pieces of land. It's the whole parcel all the way in the Echo Park. And DTS, if they want to do good service to the communities, study that land. And in reality, we're going to be faced with one thing. Most of it's too contaminated to even build. So we have to lift the standards up. That's the real tragedy that we're seeing here as they go through the state system is lifting the bar, lifting the bar, but you get nothing in return. And it's all at the risk of the health safety of the public. And I think that's something that we all have to take in when we look at these projects because they shouldn't be built here. And they shouldn't be built by many standards. And in fact, that whole area, if you look at the topography, and I'm pretty sure that's why DTF does not want to go out of the boundaries, it would probably mark any property probably southwest of it because of the hydrology reports. The underground water will probably be contaminated under most of those properties. Most of those people that have invested in those properties will probably not be uh, able to develop the more these stories come out. And that's why they have to come out. That's this, the realization of the toxic property. This property actually is is uh, flanked by two uh, by, to the south. There's one Superfund site, uh, mm -hmm. actually that was on this property, and then uh, the owner was on this property uh, in an IIT, and then uh, to the north is the Walters property, and that's not a Superfund site. That's a brownfield, I guess. So I mean, they're just right there. Um, oh, yeah, and, and, and that's what I mean. That's why they should be doing the site testing even off-site. These pockets oh. are created by, by these disasters that happened way before our time. Okay. This is why the, the EPA and the DTSC were created, right? But they also failed us in a lot of ways. Well, they may have stringent laws. There's no enforcement on their part. There's very little to the amount that they should be putting into our neighborhood. Okay. Thank uh, you. Should we go to any other board member comments? <clears throat> I don't see any more board member, but I see public comment. I just have one comment. The city and the state and the county knowing about this and then expediting this under the guise of TLC across the street from an elementary school that is very low performing elementary school. You know, it's, it's already a suffering elementary school, but it's one of our most historic elementary schools. Uh, those kids being subject to these chemicals through an expedited process expedited process, especially through grading, uh, cancerous materials. That to me, it seems like a process that just, uh, you know, something very serious, very serious uh, uh, threat to their health. Uh, yeah, uh, in a big way. Can I add something too? Yeah. I just, um, my, my point before that I made um, when I ended my presentation was that anyone who has helped to hide this information is continuing the work of the polluters who tried to hide their contamination. And um, that's how we have to look at it. Anybody who helps hide this work is continuing that crime against the community. And um, to read through these newspaper articles and try to cherry pick information to make it look like this happened on another property and not the property in question, um, when it's quite clear from the stories that it happened at 141 West Avenue 34 is, um, it's really disturbing and that's not the job of DTSC 
it's the job of DTSC to do an honest investigation. All right, thank you, Michael. Vince, just for the record, can you just scroll through these images real quick on this PDF? Just go slow. Uh, what does that say? Go back up. Stop. Or get, get the red square in the picture. Okay, so 254 drums in a trench dug secretly. Uh, go down. Just keep casually scrolling. Go, go farther. There you go. I, I want to add also that they describe cavernous holes, not just the trench along the railroad, but cavernous holes. And in the developers' geological reports in 2019, they seemed to be looking for those cavernous holes and they identified holes that were 20 or even 40 feet deep on the property. And that's not something that DTSC brought up in their site characterization. All right. And as you can see through this, as we scroll through this PDF, this is like high profile, big stuff. The Toxic Waste Strike Force in Barry Groveman. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, they're down in the sewers taking tests is the early the mid early to mid 80s until the night, you know, and it tapered off in the 90s when it got co-opted. Uh, any other board member statements? What specifically should I ask my principal, please? Vince? What the, hmm? Anybody ha have any comments for uh, advice for uh, Diana? Yeah, what specifically should I ask my principal? Because I, right now I just have, hey, has DCS, uh, D DTSC contacted you about um, pollution in the uh, area? That's good enough. <laughs> okay. Right. And then, uh, so uh, do we have any more board member uh, questions or comments? Uh, give me one second. Oh, no, that was Deanna. Okay, now it's uh, just public and we have, we can go to uh, Go Puppet. Our public comments. Go Puppet, hey. <laughs> wow, sounds like a conspiracy. How about that? Should, do you want to give them the magic phone number? Oh, yeah. Two one three eight nine four six nine four seven. <laughs> oh, what's that number again? Two one three eight nine four six nine four seven. <laughs> That's the secret phone number. That's for people who pay to play. <laughs> yes. And now we have a special guest, ladies and gentlemen, one of the former developers. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. Now, you know, you know, you know, you know. Uh, I've been building a long time, see? Now, you see, three things you gotta do. You gotta pay off the building inspector, you gotta pay off the council member, and you gotta donate a lot of money to the office holder account, see? Now, that's what we did in the 80s, see? And we did it in the 90s, see? Now, today, we gotta hire EKA, England or Canabby and Allen, or one of those other big firms, see? And then we give them the money, see? And then they lobby, see? And then we still do the other three things, see? So I don't know what you guys are doing here, see? <laughs> but, but, but remember, this city is controlled by the mafia, see? And we're gonna build, build, build. And we're gonna keep on building. That's what we're gonna do, see? And we're gonna build 40, 50, 60 stories, see? And everybody knows it, see? And we're going to keep destroying those documents, see? Thank you very much. So as you can see, Mr. Weezar's dream is continuing. He's an advocate for better building. And yes, a few, uh, maybe a few children here or there will be poisoned, but it's for the common good, isn't it? Building more housing. Gil Cedillo, build, build, build. Mitchell Englander, build, build, build. Weezar, build, build, build. Everybody, build, build, build. And that's what it's all about, people. Now, do you want to stop the building and go back to tiny little homes and little mom and pop businesses? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> yes. Then good puppet rules that this neighborhood council is made of normal people. <laughs> I suck at that. Goat puppet, providing friendly engagement. And I want to thank my special guest. Now, um, you know, where are you going, sir? Uh, 
Well, I, I'm currently uh, serving some time, so I, I got to go back. I'm, I'm, yeah, I got another five months left. I'll be out. Thanks a lot. I, I, you know, and again, uh, I love building. Anytime you want to build, let me know when I get back out of the jail and I'll pay off the judge. I'll get my conviction reversed, and I'll be right back there building again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, builders. And thank, thank you. you, snitches. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Goat Puppet. Um, any other public comments on this item? We have no more public comment. All right. And so there is no action on this item. We're going to thank our uh, presenters, Michael and Jessica, uh, and we will move on to the next item. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, so our next item is, and thank you, uh, we're running a little behind, but um, so we're gonna move on to item number 10B, subject briefing, HSR, California High Speed Rail, EIR, Environmental Impact Report. 10B1, presenter, the California High Speed Rail Authority, HSR. So um, in our attendee side, uh, we have a presenter from the California High Speed Rail, I believe. Uh, let's see. Um, could you please raise your hand? Is that Chelsea Dickerson? Yes, Chelsea. Um, Vince, could you uh, bring her to the panelist side? And I believe Chelsea is going to have some visuals. So we'll need a share, shared screen. Um, so the HSR, the High Speed Rail, Let's see, so uh, subject uh, B, 10B2. Description, the California High Speed Rail Authority recently released the final environmental impact report, EIR. The authority will provide the board a briefing on the upcoming availability of the final EIR for the Burbank to LA section and what we can expect on the document. The final EIR was published, and this is kind of contradictory, yeah, in November and goes to the authority for consideration in January, 2022. So the um, section of the, this is my um, just clarification here, the section of the high-speed rail that goes through Lincoln Heights, it's going to go through the Clover area of near Lanza Brothers and Albion and Downey Park. And it's gonna swing back on Main Street over the Main Street Bridge. And there is going to be a new bridge for the high-speed rail, which is very high up in the air above the existing bridge. Uh, this is proposed. I'm not saying there is going to be, but uh, in any case. So uh, Chelsea, um, can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. And I actually have three other attendees with me, if they could be promoted, LaDonna, Diane, and Tyler. Okay, I got them. Donna, just like, okay, so it's Chelsea. Sorry, just our Chelsea. Okay, and uh, Tyler. Diane. Taylor. Okay, cool. And then I will be screen sharing um, my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, I gave you access to the co-host, so you should be able to share now. Let me stop mine. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yes. Yep. I'm going to turn it over to LaDonna, who um, will provide our introduction. Uh, good evening. I'm LaDonna DiCamillo. I'm Regional Director for the California High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, also with us tonight, we have Diane Ricard, who's our project manager, and Tyler Bronstead. Tyler, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. Uh, I am the consultant, uh, the project manager that led the preparation of the environmental and engineering documents for this project. So you'll be hearing from us throughout the presentation. We'll, we'll try to keep it brief, uh, but but still give you a really good overview of what's happening at the California High Speed Rail. I like to start at the top with a program overview. Just a reminder, we were formed by voters in 2008 to connect San Francisco with Los Angeles Anaheim. Um, since that time, we've identified a phase one, which is in the dark blue on this map. Uh, we've also identified opportunities for a phase two. We are by Proposition 1A um, mandated to make that connection from San Francisco to Los Angeles, Anaheim in two hours and 40 minutes, which kind of limits what we can do with an alignment and how many stations we have. So the stations are depicted on this map uh, here by the white dots. Uh, for Southern California, we start in Bakersfield uh, and have four environmental documents between Bakersfield and Anaheim. One has been complete, Bakersfield to Palmdale. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about Burbank, Los Angeles. 
uh, go to the next slide. We've cleared, uh, as a program, we've environmentally cleared approximately 300 of our 500 mile phase one. This map shows uh, with the hashed burgundy lines uh, what has been environmentally cleared. We're under construction on 119 miles starting just north of Bakersfield to Madeira. And then the green hash mark is Brightline West, who is a private sector high-speed rail provider. Um, they are hoping to start construction this year on a Victorville to Las Vegas uh, connection and would connect to our service in Palmdale. Next slide. Um, even though our construction is predominantly right now in the Central Valley, we are starting initial investments in what we call the bookends. So there are projects in the Northern California area that are underway with Caltrain and in Southern California, these, this summarizes some of the projects we have underway, particularly at Union Station, which is Link US. We are committed to contributing 441 million to the improvements at Union Station. To, if you've ever taken a train into Union Station, you know they're dead end tracks. So the, the track you come in into, you have to, to leave on. Um, we're gonna make those run through tracks over the 101 and it'll be a much more efficient, more modern um, passenger rail service uh, station there. Uh, we've also contributed to environmental study that will have mutual benefits for Metrolink, Losan, Amtrak and others. We've recently finished engineering and procurement on a grade separation, which is one of the highest incident grade separations in Southern California. It's Rosecrans Marquardt in Santa Fe Springs. It's a T intersection for cars with a railroad track going diagonally through that. So we're, we're happy to be partnering to make that a safer crossing. And then lastly, we've contributed to some regional connector projects, uh, 389 million including some tier four locomotives for Metrolink and positive train control for their operations. Um, th this, this slide is what we refer to as stage gate. It's described in detail in our business plan, which came out uh, early last year. Uh, one of the reasons that I like to show it is, is it really outlines our program development and how we plan to proceed. We've gotten some criticism in the Central Valley because we tried to start construction and do right of way acquisition and utility relocation concurrent with some of the other construction and it, it didn't work well. Um, in theory, it would work, uh, but, it, but it just, it was too hard. Um, we were taking too long on the right of way acquisition and some of the utility relocations proved more difficult than we had anticipated. Um, so we've outlined a, a process that will guide us to um, help reduce risks of, of those kinds of things. We're currently at the end of stage two. So actually moving into the beginning of stage three with the completion of our environmental work we will be just at the, the top of stage three. And we are funded through the end of our environmental work. Um, our next phase really would be to pursue funding to advance our engineering design and start right away mapping in, in that stage three. Throughout the entire process, we will be reaching out to stakeholders and engaging with the community as we advance our design. We're at about 15% engineering in stage two, but as we advance that design, we will of course work with the community and with the cities that, that we are partnered with um, as we work through, through design and the, the detailed development. Uh, so with that, I think I'm turning it over to Diane to, to dive into the details of the Burbank to Los Angeles section. Hello, everybody. Um, so the Burbank to Los Angeles section begins uh, with our proposed Burbank Airport Station and will end at Union Station. There will be two new electrified high-speed rail tracks that will run in the existing rail corridor, except for where you see the purple at the top of the alignment, where we will have a portion underground that's a little bit over a mile and will include going underneath uh, the Burbank Airport. Um, so the Burbank two stations, Burbank Airport Station, Los Angeles Union Station, some of the benefits of this are that the proposed infrastructure will accommodate high-speed rail, Metrolink and other passenger rail volumes as envisioned in the 2018 state, state rail plan. There are features of our alignment that will improve safety. Um, this includes uh, some some features of the actual train and the tracks, and then um, that we are proposing grade separations. Um, 
there will be reduced emissions and congestion, both by a shift of travelers that are currently traveling by auto or flights who are now on our trains, which are also electrified, and then a reduction in congestion because of that and because of the grade separation. So some of the at-grade crossings um, where vehicles and pedestrians and bicycles are stalled while the gates are down, that will be free flowing movement. And then intermodal connectivity at both of the stations. And um, we are going to our board as LaDonna, I believe you mentioned uh, in a couple of weeks. And um, we're planning on getting our record of decision. Uh, the, plan, the plan is to get it in the first quarter of this year. Um, so as far as the alignment in Los Angeles, the alignment crosses the Los Angeles River near State Route 110. The designs are sensitive to the Rio de Los Angeles State Park, the Los Angeles State Historic Park and Albion Riverside Park. And we have been coordinating with the LA River Path and the Taylor Yard River Park. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and I, I think with that, Tyler is going to take over. Um, the previous slides that we're coordinating on parks uh, and, and the like, but what he's gonna go through is the changes that have been made uh, to the design that we had for the Main Street grade separation between the draft EIR, EIS, and the final um, in coordination with various stakeholders. Um, so Tyler. Thanks, Diane. So uh, just talking about the grade separation here, uh, why does it need to be grade separated? Well, right now there's two at-grade crossings where cars and trains cross uh, at the same level on each side of the Los Angeles River at Main Street. And by grade separating, you'll remove that conflict uh, for all modes of transport, including uh, vehicles, transit, bicycles, and pedestrians. It'll also allow the trains to stop sounding their horns uh, and to stop having the bells at the gates uh, at that crossing. It would reduce emissions and delays because cars and trucks would no longer be waiting for the trains to cross and would also allow for emergency vehicles to cross at all times. Uh, so at the draft EIR stage, uh, we presented a design for the Main Street grade separation uh, that we heard from the community about some concerns about it. So after the draft environmental document, uh, we went back to the drawing board and made some changes uh, to the design uh, to reduce impacts to Lincoln Heights. Uh, we had a virtual community workshop in August 2020 and uh, have since then modified the design for the final environmental document. Uh, what we have is now there, there was one single family residential displacement before from the grade separation, there's now zero. And we also uh, had four fewer commercial uh, property displacements uh, than were previously identified in the draft environmental document. Uh, going to the next slide, what I can do is kind of walk you through the change here. Um, so first I'd like to emphasize the high-speed trains will follow the existing railroad tracks in the area, so that's in blue there. Uh, basically what we would be doing would be putting in uh, overhead electrical wires to electrify uh, those tracks, but it would be basically the same tracks that are there today at the river. Uh, what you can see outlined in the, the darker black lines is the proposed Main Street Bridge, a new one, and this is the one that was in the draft environmental document. And what we heard from the community was concern that the design would basically channel cars and trucks from Lamar Street under Main Street and up to Albion Street into the park um, with the concern about having cut through traffic and trucks heading into the residential neighborhood north of Main Street. Uh, so what we then did is modified the design as shown on the next slide here. Basically, we made the bridge slightly steeper so that it comes down uh, to the existing grade more closely at Main Street and also made some other changes here. So there's now a direct connection from Lamar Street to Main Street like there is today. Uh, so any cars and trucks will just be able to use that. Uh, we put in cul-de-sacs and narrowed the crossing under uh, the new Main Street bridge there. So you could still have basically cars from the neighborhood go through there, but discourage the use by trucks. Uh, and then also uh, there are some small changes to it. You can see in kind of pink and gray uh, that will be different properties that are basically affected as during construction, we basically join them to the new main street there. Uh, I will note that this is uh, a steeper bridge, 6%, so it probably would require uh, the sidewalks on the, the bridge section to have something like a switchback or meander to make sure that we keep uh, a 5% grade in that case for the sidewalks uh, for ADA accessibility. 
And uh, yeah, so that that's the basic uh, pieces of that. I, I think it was noted earlier, and I, I will note it basically ends at Avenue 17, uh, just to the west of Lanza Brothers. That's where it would tie back into the existing uh, Main Street that's there now. And the other thing I'd note is that the current Main Street Bridge, which is historic, uh, would be kept afterwards, and uh, we're hoping would be able to be implemented maybe with some of the uh, proposed LA River Path uh, concepts that would be coming through the area. Thank you, Tyler. Do you have the profile image of the bridge and the height of this bridge in con in respect to the Main Street Bridge, how high it goes up? Uh, I do. We'll have to switch over to me for Sharon for a minute here. Oh, and we'll, sorry. Let me pull that up. Vince, can you, sh can you, uh, so yeah. this uh, great separation, right? It, it includes this bridge that will go over Main Street Bridge and it's uh, high up in the air. Yes, that is correct. And typically the clearance we're looking for is about 24 feet over the railroad tracks. And let me get and this pulled up. Yeah. So from the bed of the LA River, it would be 50 something feet, right? Or I forget. Uh, probably in that range, yes. So this is exaggerated vertically, but you can see the tracks are basically on either side of the river here uh, with clearances around 24 feet. Uh, coming up and coming back down. Okay, and so then, then that dashed line is the Main Street Bridge, correct? Or what is that? Uh, uh, it's basically the existing ground under the bridge. Oh. Um, this this would be just to the north of the current Main Street Bridge, which you can see here. And so in that image you have of the profile of this uh, proposed HSR bridge, would the um, Main Street Bridge be at where the right angle, the, the, the before the arch on the underside of the bridge or where does it go across like so yeah so trains would not be running on this bridge this would be for cars and trucks oh so it's a yeah so it's main street going up in the air oh you're demoing wait so main street bridge is going to be torn down or what no so it would the the existing main street bridge is right here and would be kept in place uh but there would basically be a new main street bridge higher up just to the north of it the train tracks would stay at the same level that they are today on both banks of the river. So then the, 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 the Main Street Bridge as we know it, would it just be a pedestrian bridge or what? what? Yeah, so we, we actually don't have uh, detailed plans for what it would become, uh, but we've envisioned something like a pedestrian or bicycle promenade, something like that, since you would have it going over the river here and it would hopefully connect in some way to the bike paths that are planned along the river. Okay, so because this train's going down where the blue tracks go and it, it kind of intercepts uh, Main Street Bridge, uh, they're proposing um, a new bridge that goes over Main Street Bridge that's 24 feet from the existing bridge that swings Main Street around the corner down into the regular Main Street. Everybody. All right, cool. Um, thank you, Tyler. Okay, I'll stop sharing and hand it back to Chelsea. All right, Chelsea. Hey, if anybody, sorry I interrupted everybody. Um, is there a, a, uh, any more presentation on the? There is, let me just get back to, sorry. Oh, no, okay. And it went. Just real quick on where we are, are at with status. This is a just a different, graphic depiction of our stage gate. We're at the end of stage two, um, moving into stage three. Um, next slide summarizes our board meeting. So if um, anyone wants to comment, our comment, our board meeting is a two-day board meeting, January 19th and 20th. Public comment will be taken January 19th. Um, to comment, you need to register at our website, hsr.ca.gov. Um, and then on day, there will be a presentation by staff on day one and um, based on inquiries from our board, uh, staff will come back on day two and do a deep dive uh, on whatever topics the board would like us to provide more information on. And with that, I think, oh, uh, the documents are available for viewing in these locations, um, including the Lincoln Heights Branch Library uh, or at our office downtown by appointment. So if you'd like to view the documents also, of course, online. And with that, I think it's just our contact information to stay in touch. So 
we're available to answer additional questions if you have. Them. All right, thank you, Donna, um, Tyler, and Diane. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll go to uh, any board member questions. Uh, we have uh, Diego. Diego. Hi, thank you. Uh, I had a question for Tyler. Um, so just to clarify, the new Main Street Bridge, there would, because it goes over both of the rail, railroads, including the Metrolink Railroad and the Union Pacific Railroad, there will not be any idling necessary, correct? Uh, idling for cars? Yeah, because currently the Main Street Bridge the Union Pacific Railroad that runs there, the, the train, you know, there's a train that goes through there and then sometimes there's a, there's a, there's a traffic light that prevents cars from going while the train is crossing. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, there would not be. It would be kind of equivalent to Spring Street or Broadway just to the north where the bridges kind of go up and over the railroad tracks and there's no, no lights, no crossing gates, anything like that. Okay, got it. And then I had another question. So the high-speed rail uh, train seems to be running along where the Metrolink trains go. Is there going to be need to add another railroad line or is it, is there a Metrolink no longer using those? How's that working? So uh, right now the situation is that Metrolink exclusively runs on the west bank of the river except for a few trains they send up to uh, their maintenance facility uh, right now. Uh, plus freight trains on the East Bank. So that's who run on the East Bank. What we'd be looking at is uh, using both sides of the river uh, more frequently. <clears throat> and so we'd look at having all the high-speed rail trains would have to be on the West Bank because that's the tracks that would be electrified. Uh, but Metrolink and Amtrak trains would be able to run on the West Bank or the East Bank. And so we'd basically more fully use all four tracks that run along the river right now. Got it. Okay, and then the Main Street Bridge, the old one, uh, it, it's essentially going to be cut off from any traffic, so it's just going to be standing there. <laughs> yeah, so you wouldn't have the crossings there anymore, so you wouldn't be able to basically access it kind of across the tracks like you do right now, okay. um, but we are looking for how best to connect it to the, the bike path, uh, bike, bike and pedestrian path that would be probably going over or under the old bridge and having uh, a connection there. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other board member questions, comments? I just, I have a few comments on it. Um, my, my, my concerns with it and the project, like I seen before, and I would never seen reports on when, when the trains pass through, I know that the electrical trains are a lot more heavier than our regular trains. Um, the vibration that it causes because it's close to a lot of homes that are over if not close to a hundred years old. And some of some of these issues along the river, including in, in uh, like Elysian Valley, Cypress Park, have issues from foundations moving in and they're not from local earthquakes. My other concern too, is the wildlife and the effect that the train will have along, along the uh, Los Angeles flood control channel. Um, birds have a habit of standing on those wires. Um, I know some of them, <clears throat> They need to touch both of them, but I, there's just times where they get stuck on there, and I've seen them along the uh, blue line. So those are my two concerns with that, is the housing and the shaking of the trains as they go through, and then what is what are they doing for wildlife? Sure, so I think I can uh, speak to both those issues. Um, first of all, on the vibration, weight, things like that, I, I think, and LaDonna can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think actually the electric trains will be quite a bit lighter um, than the trains that are out there now, the freight trains that run through. Um, one of the main reasons why is because the electric trains don't have to carry their fuel uh, and you don't have kind of the heavy freight loads that you'd often have there. Um, the other thing you'll have is that uh, <clears throat> the tracks will likely be built to a better standard uh, than they are there today. Um, so that, that would hopefully cut down on vibration, anything that you'd be feeling there now. And I'll say also overall, we're not really proposing to increase the train speeds through this area at all. Uh, so since the curves, which is basically what determines how fast a train can go, aren't really being modified, uh, they'll be going through at the same speed uh, as trains do today and really starting to speed up into really high speed type of operation, uh, Burbank to the north. Um, I, I hear you on the wildlife concerns and uh, LaDonna, 
or Diane mentioned earlier, the coordination we're doing with uh, Los Angeles River, with uh, the park areas around, especially Taylor, Taylor Yard and places like that. And we, we do have a full biological resources uh, chapter and coordination with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, focus on those types of issues. I have, I have a, thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, I have a statement. Yeah, so um, uh, I just wanna ask you guys like how familiar you are with this area. Uh, the site where Albion Park is, that's the site of the Yangna village. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so this train, like we're going through right there, it's going through the oldest industrial residential corner in Los Angeles dating back, well, the industrial part dating back to the 1870s and then the homes even before that. Uh, uh, let's see. And I want to know if you're familiar with the displacement of the old Chinatown, Dogtown, and Macy Street neighborhoods in the early, early 30s um, that were on the site of the current Union Station. It was urban clearance, slum clearance. Uh, so uh, everybody was displaced. It was horrible. Um, they were demolished. Uh, and the site in which, okay, so the for every so everybody knows the green spots on this map, those are that's the right of way parcel acquisition. Those will be demolished, correct? Uh, the green parts. On the uh, I would say it's likely on the east bank there. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so all those spots to the uh, west of Lancebros will be demolished. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, this was a site of major. So this site right here. Okay, so where San Antonio Winery is, and all, you know, basically uh, that's the site of the major biggest displacement in Lincoln Heights historically. Uh, the Clover Street neighborhood, uh, which was like Lamar Street, Cardinal, Antonia, uh, down to Alhambra Ave, uh, was demolished in the mid 60s for the, by the Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, this was the area where uh, all of the migrant workers and low income, uh, just the indigenous and everybody lived. Uh, and then it's, what I'm saying is, um, and then you have Downey Park that was now $17 million renovation, I believe, uh, which is now called Albion Park. Uh, uh, all of our parks, the boundaries of our neighborhood are bordered by freeways and trains and it's, it's uh, super toxic and uh, disorienting and dangerous for kids. Um, but also, uh, I want you guys to know about, uh, I know on the EIR, it lists, the EIR is basically all the uh, DTSC, all the uh, environment, the polluted sites, right? So since this is the oldest industrial corridor in LA, we have the most polluted sites. So uh, you're running through, uh, there are super fun sites all around there. Uh, and then, and I'm, I'm glad you guys got some of them all, on your EIR that aren't listed on DTSC. Uh, I just want you to know that this is a neighborhood that's been heavily traumatized by not only the freeway construction in the 50s that cut our neighborhood up and divided it, but this area that you're running through is like the most damaged area that it's just like a people, the collective memory of what happened is like very strong. So if there's any way that this train, because it wants to run in a straight line on the tracks, right? If you can make it stop, or go under the Main Street Bridge or dig a hole, uh, something, but just it's anything to avoid any demolition or interference on our Main Street that just goes over our regular bridge. Because these bridges are historic monuments, these neighborhoods are historic, the most historic in LA. Uh, it's uh, super profound, this train going through here. Uh, that's what I have to say. Uh, anyway. Any other board member comments? I don't see any more board member. Is okay. there anyone in the public that wishes to make a comment? I don't see any public comment. All right. Oh, one second, one second. We have one person. RR, can you please state your name for the record? Yeah, my name is uh, Ronnie Rudolph with San Antonio Winery. Hey, Ronnie. Hi, so I've been contact with meetings with Tyler, Chelsea, and so forth. Um, 
there there have been some slight corrections i i mean i can say that i'm not for this project um obviously due to the fact of what it's doing um i don't think a lot of people understand and they still haven't really in my opinion really made them understand how big this bridge is going to be it's essentially the equivalent of the the broadway bridge at the bottom going to the top and they haven't really actually said what they're going to do with main street i don't think it's high speed rail's problem to deal with main street it would belong to the city so then it becomes vacant right away i mean for me it just seems like a a place where trash i mean homeless and anything will just go there because i don't believe that they're just going to build a park on the main street bridge that's already there um they haven't really given real answers to what that's going to be and that's probably my biggest concern because now it's what happens with that does it just rot away and then eventually just die and fall down with an earthquake because it's not being upkept um i think another problem too is what it's going to look like for the park how that's going to just overshadow the park um the the noise that it's going to bring to the park um th there's a number of things that I mean, I've been talking with Tyler and, and, and people that are on this board now 18 months, almost two years in which we've given, you know, our displeasure with what's going on. Um, I think the biggest thing that they can try and do is to put it under the Main Street Bridge. I don't think that that's been entirely explored. Um, I think it's possible, but I, I, I'm just here to say that I don't think that this is a, a great idea. I, I don't think that it's going to stop. I think it's going to continue because of the federal money that's coming through. But it, from here all the way going north, there's there's a lot of issues with the high speed rail. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Any other public comments on this? Excuse me. Yes, we have uh, Pedro Ramirez. Hi, Pedro. Hi, Pedro. Hi. Good evening, everybody. So um, I actually had a lot more questions, but Tyler answered them for me in the previous question because Diego had the same concerns as me. Um, but one of the questions, I guess one of the main questions, you know, like uh, RR just mentioned said, um, but how loud would this electrical train be in comparison to right, like the trains that pass through there now? Uh, I think it would likely be quieter, um, an electric engine versus a diesel engine. Um, so it, it, it's not going to be more, I'd say equivalent or, or less. Okay, and then the next question that I have is um, during the building process and all of this, would there be an interruption to the traffic on Main Street? Because, you know, like a lot of us use this actual bridge to commute to work every day, me being one of them. And so would there be an interruption in that or would it be like, you know, you complete one and then you kind of block off the other? Uh, it would be more the latter. So we'd be looking at a staging plan to keep the old Main Street Bridge basically up and running until the new one opens. And then the last thing, I think this is more of a comment than it is an actual question. And it kind of piggybacks off of uh, what uh, RR said is, um, you know, what, what's good, like, what, the thing that worries me is that if they cut this off or whatever, and you said like a promenade or whatever, that's fine. But you know, on the off chance, you know, that, that doesn't happen. I mean, if you, any of you live in area seven, like I do, you guys know that we are already littered to the brim with like, there's people in RVs. Like I have personally have gotten things stolen from like the people that are like squatting here. Like I've had multiple altercations with people stealing stuff. And it's just like, if that gets cut off, it's just, it just feels like a, a little, I guess, cubby space for them to just kind of like build off of and then, you know, it gets neglected by the city and then it just gets worse than it already is. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Pedro. Any other public comments? You have no other public comment? Um, I, I just want to make one final comment, I guess. Um, so everybody knows, you know, this is not made popular by the city or whatever, but uh, the site where the Main Street Bridge, right before it crosses over into Lincoln Heights, and well, basically the whole bridge, both sides, that's the site of the uh, Zoot, the start of the Zoot Suit Riots in 1942, right, Vince? Or is it 43? 
after Sleepy Lagoon. And that's when all the sailors came down from uh, the Naval Academy right over at, at uh, La Loma, Palo Verde and Bishop, Bishop and then started uh, trying to beat any uh, Mexicans or whatever. And um, yeah, so, uh, and then they were intercepted by our neighborhood and Dogtown at the bridge. And then they were all put in jail um, and the police uh, were on the side of these sailors. And those, uh, those, those people defended our neighborhood, you know, the locals. So this is like a super important site that hasn't been recognized, but the thought of it being like under the shadow of this new bridge, uh, the high-speed rail. I just want you guys to know how like special and like just significant these er this area is that you're going through and um, to learn more about it and to, yeah, honor it and uh, not desecrate it. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, thank we you. Have no more, we have no more public comment. I didn't see any more. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, we want to thank the high speed rail team for being here. And then um, hopefully if we have any more questions in the future, we can get them to come back. Yeah. I do want to add that we are committed to 100% renewable electric. I, we, we kind of shortened the presentation um, to, to put in the uh, what you really have a tight agenda. Um, but we are 100% a renewable energy. We have a very aggressive sustainability program. Um, we didn't go through a lot of the uh, river measures that we've added to our environmental documents and the commitments that we've made there. So maybe we can have Chelsea follow up with, with some of those, uh, a summary of some of those other things that we've committed to as we move through the neighborhood. And we certainly understand um, your concerns and wanna work with you. As I mentioned, we're at 15% design and uh, we will be working with the community throughout the process uh, to identify what you, what you want the details to look like. And, and uh, we can work with you on what you, what you'd like to see with the existing Main Street Bridge as well. So there's a, a lot of work we can continue to do with this, uh, with working with you. Um, and uh, I guess with that, unless you have further questions, we'll follow up with su a summary of some of the other measures we put in place that I think you'll be interested in. Thank you, Donna. So Donna, the, the, the projected date, like say when this is co comes to fruition, right? When it's created and it exists, what would that be? We are, as I, as I mentioned very briefly, um, we're only funded through environmental at this point, through the environmental work. So we are looking to the federal infrastructure bill now. Once we get the environmental clearances, we can start identifying early start projects and, and next steps, but we have to pursue the funding for that first. So at this point, we are not funded for those stages and I, I can't really give you a good timeline. So the date when this bridge would ever be built is still up in the air, right? Until the funding- A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, but it would be decades, correct? Uh, not necessarily, no. Um, we we think we have a, a pretty good project and mutual benefits for Metrolink and Losan and Amtrak, um, and that there's a lot of work that, that we can do that would be actually helpful to those operations and modernize that system and make it more efficient. So um, we just have to see how those grants come together and, and how that that unfolds. Thank you, Adano. All okay. right, thank you guys so Thanks, much. Guys. Thank you, thank you. Right. Thanks Good for having us. <clears throat> yeah, this, is gonna be, this video is gonna be on YouTube so everybody can see it. And uh, yeah, so our community can get more informed on this. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. So next we're gonna move on to the uh, one of the final items, uh, item 11A, item 11A, uh, it's a new agenda item, uh, community impact statement. So a discussion of possible action on community impact statement regarding council file 211385. This is kind of similar to one that we wrote before about, so this is a letter to LA city planning. This is a community impact statement. Uh, let's see. So it's in regard to uh, city planning. Uh, yeah, so uh, the title of the uh, motion is on-site posting mailing notices slash effective stakeholder notification slash discretionary land use actions. And this was written by Bob Blumenfeld, uh, I think in November. He's on the plum committee. Um, yeah, so uh, it would be that we support his uh, motion. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, the thing is, so the, his whole motion, Vince, can you go back? We're just gonna make this quick. Can you go back to the, 
Okay, so it would be item, yeah, there, Blumenfeld. So Bob Blumenfeld's critical of uh, city planning's notification uh, procedures for uh, upcoming hearings and, you know, public notification protocol. Basically, I uh, saying it's insufficient, it's not in the right languages, doesn't contain enough information, people don't know what the heck they're talking about on this paperwork and don't get involved. The public's not being involved in land use decisions. So um, he kind of writes something funny. He says, uh, however, the city's existing posting requirements fail to achieve their full potential. They're posted for a limited time, 10 days in advance of a hearing, are relatively small and easy to miss, are not designed to attract attention, and usually contain little information other than technical land use planning jargon that can make it difficult for the general public to understand the project. And I just wanna mention like the public hearing notice for the most recent proposed project at Flat Top, that house, it was a poster taped on a stick that had nothing written on it. It just said public notice. So, uh, Vince, could you go back to the, uh, community impact statement. So it's just us like saying we support Bob Blumenfeld's motion for city planning to be more specific and uh, inclusive and like, equitable in its posting stuff. Uh, but it's just saying like, there are 39,000 people in Lincoln Heights, you know, majority don't speak English. Uh, also, yeah, we need uh, multilingual, postings, we need them to be done on time on the planning website, people need to be notified and city planning needs to do more outreach because uh, otherwise it's just the city doing what, what they wish and building what they wish. I'm gonna make the motion to approve, uh, give me one second, the community impact for on-site posting mailing notice, effective stakeholder notification, discretionary land use action. Uh, council file CF two one one three eight five. Is there a second? I'll second. Ben seconds. Uh, open it up for a uh, board discussion. If there's anybody, any board member that wishes to make a comment, they can do so by raising their hand. Hey, any any board member comments on this? I don't see any, Sarah. Hey, any public comments on this community impact statement? I don't see any. Um, and one more thing, yeah. Uh, if this, when this goes to city council, we need a, an emissary. Uh, Fernanda, would you feel comfortable speaking on this item? When is the uh, meeting for that? Well, it hasn't hit, city council hasn't like put it up as an item yet mm -hmm. uh, for their voting. But uh, if you would, I guess I would appoint you as an emissary to speak on this item. Great, I accept. Okay, and it will be from this area. Okay, so now we will take it for a vote. Uh, so, uh, motion, Vince, can you restate the motion? Uh, the motion is to approve the on site posting mailing notice, effective stakeholder notification, discretionary land use actions, um, and appoint uh, Fernanda Sanchez as the emissary to the board for the comment. Council file CF21138. Oh, great. Thank you, Vince. And then uh, with that, we'll, we will do roll call. Uh, Fernanda? Sarah Klingenning? Uh, yes. Uh, ben Wadsworth? Yes. Vincent Chente? Yes. Fernanda Sanchez? Yes. Nancy Soto? Yes. Daniel yes. Madera? Yes. Didier Delizer? Yes. Joanna Iraeta? I'll go back to you. Diana Tran? Yeah. Annalie Hart? One second, I have to unmute her because she's on the... Okay, give one second. Annalie, if you can hear us. Yes. Come back. Oh, there she is. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Joanna Iraeta. Melanie Bolomo. Yes. Diego Zapata. 
I'm so embarrassed to say that I am in ineligible, but I will get onto my training ASAP. <laughs> Sorry. Well, well, can, if, if you have it, if he hasn't taken his ABLE training, can he still vote, Vince? Yeah, I don't think the ABLE training made mention that he couldn't vote. It's yeah, no, you can still vote, Diego. Oh, okay, then sure. Um, I just wanted to make that note. <laughs> Is your vote? Um, yes, it's a yes. Gil Revelo? Gil Arevalo. I'm sorry, I was uh, muted. Uh, I have some trouble with the with the language, so I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Steve Lucero. Yes. Selena Ortega. Yes. Right. Motion carries. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, everyone. So next, we'll move on to uh, the two final items here. Uh, so item number 12, non-agenda public comment, two minutes per person. So for the final public comment, because we like as many public comments as possible, if there's anybody from the public who has a non-agenda public comment, please um, raise your hand or press star nine. I see none. All right, so we'll move on to the final uh, final item, item number 13, adjournment. I make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I second. Selena I seconds. All in favor, just say aye. 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 All opposed, we don't have nobody opposing. Motion's unanimous. Okay, so motion carries. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you all for staying in. And Thank we'll you so see much. you at our next meeting.